voice, I think, has been silenced by despondency and despair. And uh, the despondency and despair arises out of the complete failure of the Indian legal system, uh, which was called upon to handle this case. So what I plan to do, and it is my belief that these if you can call them mistakes, I don't know. Uh, they were conscious decisions, so it's a bit difficult to refer to them as mistakes. And as I said, I don't have a name for what happened. I, I'd like to know whether, Sunita, you have a name. Some people refer to it as a disaster. Some people refer to it as an accident. Some people refer to it as industrial genocide. But frankly, the name of the animal is not known to me because the no investigation was ever conducted into the cause of what happened on the intervening night of 2nd, 3rd December 2000, uh, 1984. There's no report. Look as you may. Even in the introduction that was given, you will see all those were reports of the 90s, they were reports of the 2000 era. Where is the report of 1984? Such a report does not exist. Uh, anywhere in legal or in uh, informal or in NGO literature. It's just not known. Uh, there was a commission of inquiry appointed by the state of uh, Madhya Pradesh uh, to inquire into the cause, which in my opinion would be the most important issue, which links to the issue of liability, it links to the issue of justice. Unless you know the cause, how will you find out who is liable? And um, this Commission of Inquiry was wound up, but I did appear before the Commission of Inquiry and I did ask the question in the Commission of Inquiry as to what was the composition of the chemical which was being manufactured in UCC and what was the nature of the gas which escaped. Uh, the answer that I was given at the Commission was Sorry, madam, we can't explain this to you because these substances are covered by trade secrets and patents. Now, this in the light of the fact that on the very first day more than 2,000 people had died, no disclosure was made. In my opinion, the highest act of criminality occurred after the disaster and the highest act of criminality was refusal to share with the affected community or with the government what is to be done. How do we treat these people? What can we do for damage control? That information was not shared. Not only was it not shared, it was consciously kept away. Uh, at one point it became clear that it was cyanide poisoning. And it's a known fact that uh, uh, sodium thiosulfate is the only antidote to cyanide poisoning. So some enterprising doctor from Germany came to India armed with sodium thiosulfate, wanting to <laughs> cure the community. He was asked to leave the country. Now the reason for this is because the moment you admit that sodium thiosulfate is actually giving you results, you are actually establishing that these people have been poisoned. And this is, the, this is what Union Carbide wanted to avoid. So they actually sent this German fellow packing back home. And the government of India did not manufacture sodium thiosulfate and make it available to the public, which meant they got no symptomatic relief. They got no uh, therapeutic relief. And as I said, it's a greater act of criminality than the actual escape of the gases. Then comes the cold question of what to do now, where to sue? And as has been pointed out, suits were filed in the United States of America. So why United States of America? Because Union Carbide Company had its registered office in the United States of America. And rightly so, all the Indian NGOs wanted to hold Union Carbide Corporation responsible, not the Indian subsidiary, that is Union Carbide India Limited. Now, the suit was thrown out of the United States of America on the ground that it's more convenient to try it in India. Fair enough, in India, the government had already enacted a law called the Bhopal Gas Leak Desire. There are lots of stories around that period, which I don't have the time to share with you, but it was amazing. You saw the government of India argue in an American court that our Indian legal system is not capable of handling this disaster. And then you saw people like N.A. Palkiwala hired by Union Carbide making statements that the, uh, you know, the Indian legal system is just bright and brilliant and please send this suit back to India. 
Of course, they won that round and the suit was sent back to India. The reason is very simple, as Raj said, because human life in India is cheap. If the suit had been tried in America, there's no way it would have been settled at $470 million, which it finally came to be settled at. Now, how did this settlement come about at $470 million? The fact of the matter, that's another secret we will never know. Some of the judges who gave that order are not in this world. They have departed from this world, so they haven't lived to tell the tale. Some are there. Some uh, who settled uh, got appointed to the International Court of Justice as judges. And of course, we knew from that moment onwards that there was a quid pro quo uh, between the United States of America as a country which was interested in denying the liability of UCC. All of you know that Warren Anderson, who was then the uh, managing director of UCC, uh, escaped from the country with the active connivance of the government of India and never returned. Jumped bail, was declared an absconder, and I'm told that he died on the 29th of September 2014. But the interesting fact I discovered was that this uh, fact of his death in the days of internet was not known in India. In India we got this information one month later after he died. It, even that fact of his death was kept a secret for one month because they knew that there would be reactions in India and I was told that uh, when the victims of the Bhopal tragedy got the information in, uh, in Bhopal, they actually put up a picture of Warren Anderson at the factory gate and every one of them went and spat on that picture. So that was their form of getting justice. Now there were many reasons for the sellout. Um, which occurred um, on the 14th of February 1989, 14th, 15th February 1989. Um, one of them was that the victims were not consulted for whether they want this settlement or don't want a settlement. Now, I'm sure in today's day and age, many of you would agree that well, this itself is an act of injustice. If it concerns me, then I should know what is being settled about me. But the government of India had passed a law under which they had taken to themselves the power to decide whether to settle or not to settle and how much to settle at. And this was the law under which they went to court after a closed door negotiation uh, between the government, the lawyer for whom was, uh, you know, negotiating, they signed the settlement and it was done at $470 million. Now, when the victims challenged it, they asked, on what basis did you arrive at this figure? How many are dead? We don't even know. And the figure given at that time was uh, 30,000 injured and about 2,660 dead. That came to the figure of $470 million. Today we know um, from government records, they have recorded 1,500 deaths and they've recorded about five and a half lakhs of injured persons. So as, I'm, as Raj said, and I'm also saying this is not a number game, it's not about how many died and how many didn't die. It's about the litany of lying, of cheating, of manipulating legal systems, of corporates getting away with absolutely <coughs> next to no liability. And even the criminal case was set aside. It is only when the victims went to court and said, how can you do this? It's one thing for you to settle on money. How can you ever compound a crime? And that is when the Supreme Court sat up and said, all right, uh, when it comes to the crime, we'll withdraw the crime. And as you've been told, the original charge was for culpable homicide, not amounting to murder. But people like Keshav Mahindra went to court, challenged that uh, charge sheet, and they said, you can't accuse us of culpable homicide. Where is the intention to kill? There is no intention to kill. You might, if you want, uh, prosecute us for negligence, and the court agreed with that. And uh, that is how the convictions were in the region of one year and two years for some uh, lowly officials. What happened to Union Carbide Corporation? It got taken over by Dow Chemicals. What happened to Union Carbide India Limited? It also got taken over by another Indian company. And so, uh, like the smile I suppose from a Cheshire cat's face, the offending company has disappeared from the face of this earth, leaving no trace. I would just like to end by saying that 
the, I, I wrote in the, the last, I spoke on this subject, the last I wrote on this subject was 94, after that I've never written about it again. And at that time I said, the, the suit has disappeared without leaving a legal legacy. Now my interest in this whole, I speak as a lawyer, I'm coming from the position of a human rights lawyer, and my interest in this case was that forever and ever there should be a system in place within the law where victims of similar tragedies will be able to raise their claims and get justice. That unfortunately did not happen. Now what is pending in court is um, you know the decontamination of the uh, of the of the soil, and of course the contamination of groundwater, both of which are very very important and significant issues. So to conclude, yes, sometimes people say the Environment Protection Act of 1986 was the gift of the Bhopal victims. What gift? Uh, what is the point of a gift if they themselves didn't get justice? And I think can't have these type of trade-offs where you say, all right, uh, we, the, the gains have been the Environment Protection Act. I'm not for a moment trying to run it down. All I'm saying is the complementary component of justice also has to be there. Thank you. Thank you.